Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 328th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Have you grown a perfect and scrumptious vegetable one year and wished every crop would be that successful? Well, it starts with recognizing which plants are working best in your landscape and saving those seeds. We can teach you how. Text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWANTTOSAVESEEDS.COM and you will receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how you can save your own. Today on our podcast, we have someone who helps farmers build their brands. We're talking with Tim Young about growing a farm business. Tim's a corporate executive turned modern homesteader who founded Nature's Harmony Farm in Georgia. They produced award-winning farmstead cheese, grass-fed beef and lamb, woodlock pork, and pasture-raised chicken. This is where he, his wife Liz, and their young daughter milked their own cow, produced all the cheese, soap, medicine, meat, and vegetables. They truly enjoy a simple life. Tim's also the founder of Small Farm Nation Academy, an online resource devoted to helping family farmers learn skills to build their farm brands, attract more customers, and grow profitable farm businesses. He's written nine books, including How to Make Money Homesteading and The Accidental Farmers, is a diehard Pittsburgh Steelers fan, and once kicked back while Leonard Skinner played a 4th of July acoustic set at his house for him and 24 friends. How cool is that? Welcome to the show today, Tim. Are you ready to rock? Hey, Greg, I'm always ready to rock. Sweet. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? You said I started as a corporate executive and then turned modern homesteader. I think I really started as a hick because I grew up in North Georgia and a long time ago, you know, back in high school, I actually wrote for a publication called Foxfire Magazine. Oh, yes. I didn't think anything about it, you know, because it happened to be in my school in the mountains of North Georgia. And so I wrote for them for a couple of years. And then as soon as I got out of school, you know, went right into the corporate world, you know, in Atlanta, then moved up to Boston and lived for about 20 years in New England, working in, you know, for a long time for a large communications company before I branched out and started my own marketing services business. And that was, you know, a business that grew from just me, a one person startup to 450 employees six years wow. later and, and in six countries. And I find myself, you know, on a plane traveling to Europe every six weeks, California every couple of weeks, just always going somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, one of those li lives like a lot of us have. And, you know, if something happened around 2005, 2006. I think I, like a lot of people, I started, you know, becoming aware of how unaware I was, where my food came from. Oh, that's well said. Sure. And it's like, thanks a lot to, you know, Michael Pollan and Joel Salatin mm -hmm. and many people like that. And rather than doing something sensible, like, well, let's just go to the farmer's market. <laughs> we sold our home on a golf course uh -huh. near, near Atlanta, went and bought 126 acres and said, well, let's just start a diversified livestock farm. Now, forget the fact that neither of us had ever, you know, petted a cow, chicken or a pig or seen anything like that. And neither of us had a farming background. We just went out and did it. I think that's the entrepreneurial side of me. Yeah. And, you know, we had a blast, you know, helping to reconnect so many animals with the land and helping consumers to reconnect with their food. So- I want to know, what was the spark that had you go from being a corporate guy to essentially a rancher, a farmer? What what was, what was happened in that moment that you said, oh my gosh, I got to go do this? Well, I can't really deny what the spark was because I told the story in that book, The Accidental Farmers, but I took my wife for a horseback ride. This is back when we lived north of Atlanta in a typical suburb with a homeowners association and all that. We went for a horseback riding trip and we were out in the country and she said, I could really get used to this. And I said, me too. And then she, <laughs> you know, and then I said, why don't we just buy some land? And she didn't believe me, but you got to remember, Greg, entrepreneurial type people. Yep. It's just another, it's another challenge. So right. I said, all right, we started looking for land. Our criteria were, let's get something within two and a half or three hours of Atlanta. So, you know, we could get back for Skinner concerts or to see Green Day or to go to a Braves game or something like we would have time to do that if we were farmers. And of course, right. we never had time to do that. So once we started farming, we actually became more of a hermit than anything else. Right. Wow. So, all right. In your bio, it talked about Leonard Skinner. You got to tell us that quick story. How'd that happen? You know, it's funny because one of the things I say on the Small Farm Marketing Academy, I talk about how farming is 80% 
marketing and 20% production, which I, is what I found. And it's the same thing, you know, with that story there. I was a huge Skinner fan. I used to travel, you know, back in my corporate days. I'd travel sometimes eight or 10 times a year to go see them and other people play concerts. And they had just come back from a European tour in 2003. And there was a radio promotion in Boston. This is going to be their first stop back in uh, Massachusetts. And the radio promotion was Skinner was going to play a gig at somebody's house if you could get, convince them that you were the biggest Leonard Skinner fan in New England. Oh, my gosh. So partly this is, you know, true because I would go to a lot of Skinner concerts. Right. But this is partly This is partly marketing, too. So I put together a whole portfolio that demonstrated how I was the best Skinner fan, how I had <laughs> the best property for this, sent it to the radio station, you know, and then got the call that morning that they were coming. And sure enough, the bus pulled up to my house. They all got out. I had them set up, you know, uh, a few chairs and stuff. Right. Get Leonard Skinner Avenue sign. And they played an acoustic set for us. Nice. Nice. I love what you said about the marketing piece and it being 80% marketing and 20% farming, essentially. Right. In the past, I've said it's, you know, it's at least 50 50. Because if you have some great products there and you don't, you know, have a way to get them out, you know, it's, it's worthless. Then you have a compost pile. Then exactly. Then you have a compost pile. So let's, let's talk about your marketing acumen and how you overlaid it on this farming business. Well, yeah, my background was corporate marketing. I wasn't like a design guy or uh-huh. the creative side. You know, I would I ran agencies where we supported high tech companies or financial services firms and did their back end database marketing and mm-hmm. sales lead management, those kind of things. But you know, I've always been you know interested in marketing and in branding, and I pay close attention to any commercial or any billboard or anything that's related to communicating a value proposition or a message. I, I pay attention to it. Right. So when when we started the farm, I mean, our real passion wasn't, to be honest with you, our real passion wasn't the customers and let's go help feed people. Our real passion was to restore health to the land. How do we make the soil healthy? And we needed livestock to do that. So I found myself being an accidental farmer. We needed lots of cows, chickens, pigs to make that land healthy again. Well, what are you going to do if you have them all? You either have to take them to a commodity market, a sale barn and sell them, which I didn't want to do. Right. Or you've got to create a market for them. And we raised rare breed things like rare breed Osceola Island pigs that, you know, aren't real profitable to raise unless you can create a value added market. So what I learned is that you have to be very effective at communicating what your brand is, attracting people. And that's the secret, Greg. Most people think that marketing, when they're particularly in the farming world, they're always asking, how can I go get some customers? Wrong way to think about it. You've got to attract customers and you attract customers by building your brand, by espousing your values and your beliefs and getting people to want to have a relationship with you. Perfect. So you just talked about a couple of things that I kind of want to dig in a little deeper because this goes right to your Small Farm Nation Academy training, I suspect. And you talked about a value proposition. I'm a small farmer. I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and I have food that I'm growing in my front and backyard and I want to start marketing it. How do I overlay a value proposition over what I'm doing to get started? Well, you know, you're right. In the in the academy, there are business plan templates that go through the eight decisions that you have to make. But you'll have to decide, for example, who your target market is. And I'm not talking about an ideal customer because I do not believe in that myth of an ideal customer. Because I didn't start my farm thinking about, well, who's my ideal customer? I guarantee you Joel Salatin didn't start his farm thinking, here's my ideal customer. We all started our farms because of our passion yeah. of what we wanted to do for yeah. the land and for the animals. So you've got to pick your demographic. Your demographic could be, for example, people who shop at Whole Foods, or it could be people who follow the Weston A. Price diet, or it could be people that are on the paleo diet or any number of things. So pick your audience. That's going to help you to do all kinds of branding things, everything from choosing the right colors, the right verbiage, you know, the right language so that you can speak to that, that audience. And then, you know, think very narrowly for that audience so that you can create an offering for them. Because you do have to decide, Greg, what your competitive differentiating factor is going to be. You are going to be competing against not just other farms. You're going to be competing against alternatives like the grocery stores, Whole Foods and the others, and also Blue Apron or all the other new entrants that come on that that are that are competing for the same dollars that you want to go for. You have to have your competitive advantage. For most of us who are small farmers, most of the people I deal with, their advantage, believe it or not, is the relationship that they can bring 
to their customers. It's the trust. When people bought from us, you know what they were buying? They weren't buying the pork or the beef right. or the chicken or the cheese. They trusted us to produce food that was nutritious for them. They trusted us to raise animals humanely. They trusted us to do the right things for the soil and for the environment. That's the goes to know your farmer. That's exactly right. Yeah. But I tell you so, you know, something, Greg, it gets harder every day because, you know, 15 years ago, it was kind of a neat story. If you left a corporate world and you went back to the farm, it's pretty cliche today. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. who have opted out and I'm happy for that. And I think there's going to be more that opt out, but they're going to find that they really need to have some marketing chops because yeah. there's a lot of people who have that story now. Oh, exactly. Again, one of the terms that you used in this whole process, and it's one that I actually have used in, you know, in moving my business forward about 15 years ago, I was actually growing food in my front and backyard and taking them to farmer's markets. And you use the term value added products. And that's one of the things that I actually, it's, it's a great way to enter a market. If you create one of those, what, what are they and how do you do them? So, you know, the land that we bought in eastern Georgia, the person we bought it from, he was an old dairy farmer. He had uh -huh. closed it down 12 years before because he couldn't make money and he was just struggling along. And back then he was doing what everybody does in dairy. He, he was milking 100 cows. He was selling it to the co-op. So he had no control over what he got paid for milk and he had no control over what he had to pay for feed. Mm. That's a really bad place to be. Right. When we went out there, we started with livestock, but I refurbished his old dairy barn and we started milking Jersey cows. Now, we only milked 24 Jersey cows at our peak, but we took that milk and we created a small cheese operation and we learned to make farmstead artisanal cheese. And we did a pretty good job because that cheese ended up winning awards at the United States Cheese Championship, at the American Cheese Society, and at some overseas competitions. Wow. And that enabled us to be able to sell our cheese at, you know, Whole Foods and, you know, mm -hmm. other stores like that and Kroger and, you know, th those kind of places. And that enabled us to not only be profitable with that business, but in the end, I actually sold that artisan cheese business a couple of years ago to another couple who wanted, we were making 30,000 pounds of cheese a year at the time. They wow. wanted to take it, and, they wanted to take it and scale it up and I didn't want to make any more cheese. So I sold the business. So by producing value, adding value to a product, you can not only make it more profitable, but you can create a defensible competitive advantage. Because mm -hmm. think about it this way. If I was just raising chickens and producing, you know, farm fresh eggs. I might have about, I might be able to cultivate a market for that, but you could come on and replicate what I'm doing in, in no time and for very little money. Conversely, if I started the artisan cheese business and figured out how to do that, for you to replicate that, you've got to have the land to milk the animals. Yep. You've got to invest in the cheese operation. You've got to learn how to make cheese. And then you've got to age that cheese for a year before you get paid for it. So you create lots of barriers to entry there if you can succeed with that. Wow. So one of the things that I did early on when I was farming my front and backyard is I made friends with a couple of the chefs in the in my neighborhood. And I went to them and I said, listen, what can I grow for you? And that was my strategy to actually get into the market. Can you speak to that? Yeah. I mean, we, we worked a lot with chefs. I mean, we even had some James Beard Award winning chefs, you know, like Hugh Atchison out to our farm for farm dinners. And we sold to these chefs and we sold a lot of meats and stuff as well. But particularly when it came to cheese making, when I went down that path, Greg, I really talked to them about what kind of cheese. And one of the things I learned is I had some other local cheesemakers, you know, kind of competitive cheesemakers, and they were making, you know, flavored goudas, those kind of things that I found that the chefs didn't want. What they really wanted from me was just an high quality, basic cheese, like a Gruyere I made or a cloth bound cheddar. And the reason they wanted that was they wanted to add the accompaniments. They wanted to add the flavor profiles. They didn't want me to put things in the cheese to make it that way. Ah. So I talked to the chefs. I talked to the cheesemongers before I made my first wheel and said, I want to make a premium product. I'm willing to invest the year or two. It's going to take me to learn and to age it. What is it that you will value for the long term? And then it was my job to deliver. Once I delivered, that led us into getting some long-term contracts, both with restaurants, but mm -hmm. also with distributors that would actually go out and market the cheese. And that, I'm sure, built your long-term value proposition for who, who you are and what you were doing. It did, but it also did that other thing that was beneficial for us. It created a saleable asset. Now, I know a lot of us in farming aren't trying to create a business that you can sell. And I wasn't trying to create a business that we could sell. It just so happened that we had a young daughter and we wanted to spend more time with her. And that that for us meant that we wanted to kind of pull back and be more homesteaders than active farmers ourselves. But, you know, what if, what if I had not created a saleable asset? Then I'd be stuck with, like, what am I going to do with the farm? Right. And a lot of people are going out to start a farming business, and that's great. But I 
I really think you should start with the end in mind. In, in the end, what do you want that farm to look like in terms of profitability? And maybe you don't want to sell it, but maybe you want to hand down an operable business to your children. So right. you still got to you still got to create it with the end in mind. So interestingly enough, I interviewed Joel Salatin, and he's prepping his business to hand down to his kids, and he actually got it from his father. You know, he's putting this long-term legacy in place or, you know, extending it. And that's a really valuable thing that we all need to be doing to build more farms out there. Yeah, I mean, he did. He, he inherited it from his dad, founded that property in 1961. Joel has already handed it down to Daniel. I interviewed uh, Will Harris, who's a great farmer down at White Oak Pastures down in Georgia last week. Uh-huh. He will end up handing it down to his daughters. But that's the point. I mean, successful farms need to be handed down to someone or they need to be sold like any other business. And it, right there's the issue, I think, Greg, what I find is, you know, I approach the farm always as a business. Mm -hmm. Now, it happens to be the best job I've ever had. It's the thing I love the most that I've ever done, but it's still a business. But I find that most people who get into farming don't think of it as a business until way down the road. They get into right. it because they like the land, they like chickens, they like vegetables, you know, and then all of a sudden they've got surplus. So then what do I do with it? Right. So a lot of this kind of stuff, I'm sure you talk about in Small Farm Nation Academy. Tell us about your online resource, would you? Well, yeah, because one of the negative things for me that happened when we divested of our, of our farm and our cheese business is I still have this strong passion for local food and for sustainable farming. So how do I play in that if I'm not actually producing the product? And there's a lot of farmers out there, great people who are trying to do the right thing for their families, for the land, for the community. But they struggle to get customers. They struggle to be successful. And be honest with you, Greg, most of them supplement their farming business with all farm incomes. Yep. So what I'm passionate about doing is trying to help them to be more successful because I genuinely believe that most of their success is predicated on very effective marketing. Now, marketing, you know, can have a positive and a negative connotation. I'm not talking about negative marketing. I'm talking about genuinely building a brand, conveying what you do, connecting with customers and in, in such a way that, you know, they form a partnership and that they help your farm succeed. Beautiful. Beautiful. So that's Small Farm Nation. And you give courses? Yeah, smallfarmnation.com is where I have my free blog and my free podcast where I give tips to people who can't afford or don't want to afford spending any money on courses. Mm -hmm. I do have a private academy, which is a membership site at Small Farm Nation. You can find out about it as well. And the membership site is just simply you know, a monthly fee, you know, very small monthly fee that people can come in. They can quit anytime. They can sign up for a month and then be gone at the end of the month if they want to just come in, mm -hmm. take all the content and leave. I did it that way, Greg, because most of these online courses, just one simple course, you know, like on email marketing or creating a website or whatever it may be, people charge, you know, a lot of money, as you know, for oh, these yeah. courses, because it takes a lot of effort to create those courses. Inside the academy, I have, you know, over I don't know, I've created 75, 80 videos already in the academy mm -hmm. that are courses on creating your farm website, on building your farm brand, on the business planning, on email marketing, on list building, WordPress 101, all kinds of courses there to help people to become more successful with their farm business. But there's also a community in there, mm -hmm. which is a forum, which is way more valuable than being part of a Facebook group. I have a Facebook oh, yeah. group called the Farm Marketing Group, but the problem with those Facebook groups is you can't keep threads, you can't search on questions right. that have been asked very easily. So people keep asking the same question over and over again. And, you know, I wanted to create a membership site where all that information resides in one place. Beautiful. Beautiful. And you, you have a special offer for our listeners today. It's seven marketing traits of highly successful farmers. Tell us about that. Yep, there's a lead magnet that they have that they can, you know, hit the website. There's a guide I put together of what are the basic marketing traits that I've observed. And I've identified seven of them that anybody can do. But, you know, just seven traits that most successful farms demonstrate, whether it's Joel Salatin or whether it's what I did at my farm or whether it's what you do and how they're able to attract customers, get publicity and command higher sustainable prices. Perfect. So if you want to grab that free document, you go to urbanfarm.org forward slash small farm nation. So you've written nine books. Tell us about one of them. Pick what's your favorite if you have one. Oh, I don't like any of my books, Greg. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, I've, 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 I've never read one of my books after I've written it. Uh -huh. And my supporters are too kind to me on their reviews on Amazon. You know, The Accidental Farmers is a true story of what we did. It's how we left that world to this world. So I, I guess that's my favorite because I got to talk more about my wife and my family. Uh -huh. My most popular book is 
how to make money homesteading. It sells more oh. than any of the others because people are interested in various yeah. ways that they can make money homesteading. Perfect. 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 So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed how you overcame that ferry and what you might have learned from it. In the business world, my biggest failure was, you know, I don't know if all your listeners or many of them remember the dot-com crash in the oh, early yes. 2000s. Yep. I ran a business back then, and this was a point where everything was going crazy. And I, I brought in some outside investors, you know, venture capital. Oh, yeah. You know, even though I was a founder and CEO and chairman of the board, I allowed myself to change our company direction based on this outside influence and to chase the dot com craze and to be and try to be an internet play rather than the marketing services agency mm -hmm. that we were best at. And what I learned from that, Greg, is that you have to own the vision for what you're doing. If you start a business, whether it's a farm or whether it's a small business, you know, other people may have opinions. In fact, they will have opinions. Oh yes. But you you know what's best with your business. So you've got to trust yourself more than others. Perfect. And what do you consider your biggest success? Well, I won't say, you know, the truth, which is kind of cliche, which is, you know, <laughs> getting married and finding my beautiful wife and my daughter. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it's finding freedom and figuring out how oh, yes. to tap out, how to get out of the rat race. I mean, because there was a time where I was, you know, driving to and from work and working in an office and in a cubicle and all that stuff. And I haven't done that in 12 years. And I just love being out here in the country. And, you know, if I, w I've granted, I've got to drive 45 minutes if I want to see anything, but that's okay. I can always go to the town if I want to, right. but I'd rather live out here and be free. Yeah. You know, that's a really, really important discovery. And I wish I'd have found it earlier, but following your heart, doing what you love, that is, in my opinion, one of the most important things that we can do. Yeah. So what drives you? Partly I'm an entrepreneur at heart. I just always have to have some project to do, uh -huh. but I'm inspired by helping small farmers to succeed, as I talked about. And I'm also inspired to help others to live a more simple, more self-sufficient life, which is why I've written those books, you know, how to start prepping, how to make money homesteading and why I do my podcasting. I like to try to inspire people, even if it's just to take baby steps to find more freedom and independence than what they have today. Beautiful. And if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? I bet they've heard this one before. You know, out of all the books I read when I started this journey for me, I think I was most moved by Barbara Kingsolver's Animal Vegetable mm. Miracle. I just mm -hmm. thought that was a really great book. And I, I, I actually listened to it on audio a number of times. I thought she did a great job with that version of it. It was a very good portrayal of how disconnected we all are with our food. And it was very inspirational to try to do something to grab some of that you know, connection back. And what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? Ah, advice. I'm never short of advice. <laughs> my recommendation and my advice is this. Greg, it's not about how much money you make. It's about how much freedom you have. Mm -hmm. So wherever you are, whatever your situation is, take whatever steps you can, whoever you are, to stop being a weapon of mass consumption and start being a weapon of mass production. So take baby steps, learn to make your own soap, make your own cheese, make some beer, and of course, grow some of your own food because before long, you're going to be hooked just as I am and you'll be on your path to freedom. Nice. Nice. And, you know, I'm going to add one more thing here because we haven't touched on it, but you actually do a podcast. So I want you I to do. tell us, tell us about your podcast and where we could find it. Yeah, it's a small farm nation. Just go to smallfarmnation.com. It's on iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you listen, you know, and I did season one last year where I did lots of interviews of people and told their stories in an NPR kind of format of how they left their rat race and how they found success, you know, whether it was being a farmer or being a homesteader or whatever. This year, season two is all about the business of small scale farming, how to run your farm business, how to build your brand, how to do marketing, because it coincides with the launch of the Small Farm Nation Academy. Right, exactly. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Tim. My pleasure, Greg. You do a great job and I really appreciate all you do with your podcast and all your work. Oh, thank you. Absolutely. So a couple things. How can our listeners get a hold of you? Best way is just go to smallfarmnation.com. There's some free resources there. They can check out anything about me. They can even see that picture of Leonard Skinner playing at my house. <laughs> nice. And the freebie that we're giving away to them today. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yep. So download the guide, The Seven Marketing Traits of Highly Successful Farms. Learn how profitable farms attract customers, get publicity, and command higher prices. Perfect.
Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast and that free download at urbanfarm.org forward slash small farm nation. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and more. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and so much more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Have you grown a perfect and scrumptious vegetable one year and wish every crop would be that successful? Well, it starts with recognizing which plants are working best in your landscape and saving those seeds. We can teach you how. Text SEEDS to 33444 or visit IWantToSaveSeeds.com and you will receive our free webinar about why seeds matter, why saving them is easy, and how you can save your own. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.